California. Here, young Marines hone the skills critical to success on the battlefield. Many train for missions we've come to recognize as the role of the U.S. Marine Corps. But others train for a different mission, one far less familiar but equally as vital. Platoon Charlie Company. These are the first combat engineers of the U.S. Marine Corps. Like any Marine, their job is to defend freedom at a moment's notice. But unlike their brothers who use high-tech weaponry to deliver the deadly blow of high explosives, these men face a more immediate task, the application of explosives by hand. Their job? Blow the bridge, trench the road, or mine the field. Device. Basically what we do, depending on what unit you're in, um, your construction work and demolition work. We work with uh, building land fortifications as far as um, obstacles and uh, then demolition work is with working with explosives, uh, blowing up things. A lot of times if you're lucky you get to build something and blow it up. The combat engineer's job is to be as complete and diverse a Marine as the battlefield can utilize. In addition to the traditional skills of warfare, they must handle tricky and delicate explosive devices. They are expected to be the first in and the last out of a fight. They must be cool under fire and have nerves of steel. And they are expected to handle sufficient explosives to stop an enemy platoon, or their own, if they are not careful. When this detonates, this, this actually inverts with the heat and the energy. What happens, it's like this. When it detonates, it just blows straight down. That's all it does. And the heat and the energy, the force goes straight into the ground. Yeah, I think he might have got a Today's high explosive carries complex chemical designations such as RDX, HBX1, and Tetral. But most are basically nitrate-based compounds mixed with inert moderators to make them more stable. They require a severe shock or detonation to unleash their immense power. The type of explosives that, uh, that we use, there's a, there's a variety of them. It depends on the job that we're going to do. We use a, a plastic explosive called C4, used for breaching and cutting. We use TNT for like pushing stumps, doing dirt removal, or we're gonna make tank ditches. We have mines that we use to stop and channelize vehicles and personnel. Today, these Marines are rigging explosives on simulated targets. Each device does a different job but all are designed to assist the Marines in carrying out their combat duties. When the fuses are set and the troops withdrawn, it is time to test their handiwork. Explosive weapons can trace their lineage to the invention of that simple but destructive chemical compound, gunpowder. The invention of gunpowder was the single most important advance in the annals of warfare. It began in ancient China. The uh, rocket was probably the, one of the very first applications of the after the invention of black powder, propellant as it's now known, or gunpowder. The idea very basically was that um, as the black powder burnt, it carried the forward motion carried a small canister with a, some sort of tail providing stabilization. The Chinese were uh, always uh, quoted as the, the first users of these things. From them came the Indians, who, uh, who uh, showed the British what rockets were. And from them, the British went on to, to develop quite sophisticated uh, war rockets of their own, Napier and Hale rockets, for instance. In 1867, the Swedish inventor Alfred Nobel combined nitroglycerin with wood pulp to produce dynamite. The Europeans rapidly developed large guns to propel high explosives as far as possible. 
The Industrial uh, Revolution made possible great advances in the manufacture of refined steels that, that size and volume for volume were much stronger and much lighter than the old wrought iron and other materials that had been used before. So that guns became stronger, but at the same time, weight for size for size, they became lighter. So you could build much larger and larger guns that could withstand greater internal pressures. And the greater the internal pressure, the faster the shot came out of the, uh, the hole at the end, and the further it could be fired. By the early 20th century, exploding projectiles with timed fuses had been sufficiently refined that they yielded much higher casualties than their predecessors. But it would take one more critical development to bring artillery into the 20th century, rifling. What that in fact is, it's the grooves inside the barrel that twist the projectile as it, as it is pushed down the barrel. Now this twist makes the projectile spin, and so therefore it stays much more stable in flight for much longer. You can therefore make it, you point a gun at a target with a pretty fair realisation you're going to hit it. And what happened, also happened, was that to make things, the, the projectile even more stable, they became longer, they became elongated. So instead of the round cannonball, the projectile was longer, we came to the sort of the classic shell type shape that we came now. That shape spins and as it's longer you can pack more explosive into it so we actually hit the target but with a far more destructive bang. A single large shell could now do the work of dozens of older projectiles. By the First World War, weapons of unprecedented size were being developed. The largest and most infamous was the Paris gun. This German weapon fired huge 228-pound shells into downtown Paris from well behind German lines. It consisted of a very, very, very long gun barrel. I think it was about 156 calibers long, whereas most guns at the time were as 30 or 40 calibers was long. And it, from a range of 72 miles and hidden away in a forest, it could literally rain shells on Paris. That was the idea. As artillery became larger and less mobile, it was also more vulnerable to a new use of high explosives, the delivery of bombs from the air. World War I, we used a lot of bombs delivered by aircraft. What was beyond the range of an artillery piece and needed more accuracy, we had to carry in an aircraft, drop the bombs from a World War I aircraft to extend the range beyond where the forces were. So we take three-inch shell casings and just chunk them full of all kinds of stuff, everything we could put in there and make our own bombs, seal them up, put the fuse in. We'd get over a road, we'd uh, see a line of trucks. So we'd, uh, we'd try to work out our windage and we'd let them go. See? And then we'd fire them back and we'd try to watch the tra trajectory as they dropped. And sometimes we'd be two or three hundred yards off target. After you did it maybe three or four times, you got pretty good where you could come pretty close to it. During World War I, bombs grew from five pounds to over 500, and the planes of the era could carry up to 2,000 pounds of them. Aerial bombing was here to stay. At the start of its 172nd trajectory, each shell from the Paris gun reached a speed of 5,200 feet per second, almost five times the speed of sound. Modern marvels, high explosives will return in a moment. We now return to high explosives on modern marvels. While gunpowder had powered the military machines of the world for centuries, a new and more powerful explosive was finding a home on the world's battlefields. Based on coal oil, TNT was part of a new breed of chemical, the high explosive. High explosives burn at hypersonic speeds. The gases released then form deadly shock waves that shear and shatter anything in their path. This enhanced destructiveness soon migrated from the battlefields of Europe to the sea. The First World War found floating battle wagons of unprecedented size. 
On these enormous ships were guns larger than ever seen at sea. The shells fired by the big 14-inch naval guns were huge, weighing nearly a ton. They could be fired up to nine miles with ravaging effects. Large crews were needed to handle the enormous explosives. Projectiles arrived inverted on the upper hoist in a shell car. When they reached the top, they were tilted backwards onto a transfer tray and rolled onto the loading tray, where they were then rammed into the weapon. Once the projectile had been seated, counter bags were passed up from the gun pit below in groups of two. They were placed on the rammer tray and rammed in by a team of two men using a wooden pole. Once all four bags, or 420 pounds of powder, had been loaded, the breech was swung closed and a cartridge was placed in the firing mechanism uh, for the subsequent round. About 16 men operated this level of the turret. Temperatures in here could raise to approximately 120 degrees. While naval artillery claimed victories on the surface, the balance of power was shifting to explosives fired from beneath the waves. Most of the submarine technology in the First World War was very low technology. It was really a matter of putting explosives into a tin fish and sending it out propelled by compressed air with a contact detonator which exploded when it contacted something. This silent killer packing up to 500 pounds of TNT was a new twist in the stealthy delivery of high explosives and shook the navies of the world to their core. From nearly three quarters of a mile away, a submarine could sink the largest ship with impunity. Back on land, it was not large explosives, but the rapid-fire machine gun that was revolutionizing warfare. The First World War was really dominated by the machine gun and the trench and very high casualties. A two or three man team could put a large amount of firepower down very quickly. If you had lots of machine guns, the infantry could not really move because there was so much firepower there. The advent of stable explosive powders allowed for the development of rapid fire weapons. Hundreds of bullets could be fired in just minutes from a single gun. Particularly deadly was the British Vickers heavy machine gun, capable of a sustained rate of fire of 10,000 rounds per hour. Produced from 1912 to 1966, it was one of the most enduring designs of the century. Machine guns brought the trench war to a standstill. It would take one more technological advance to break the stalemate of the Great War. The first tank as we know it really evolved during the First World War. Um, in the early days of the war, the uh, Allied forces did use armored cars, but as the static situation developed, trenches, barbed wire, obviously armored cars could not cross this type of terrain. So tanks were developed in order to cross a terrain swept by machine gun fire, covered in barbed wire and covered in very deep trenches. The tank could resist the terror of the machine gun and carry its own high explosive weapon into the heart of the enemy. The tank helped bring an Allied victory, but the resulting peace would last less than 20 years. As Germany broke out of its interwar confines in the late 30s, other nations looked at their own military resources and found them sorely lacking. The largest war of all time was coming, and it was to be the absolute height of the use of high explosives in human history. Millions of tons would be used in anger, causing damage on a scale scarcely imagined just two decades earlier. While most of the world had developed their weaponry little since the First World War, 